Greetings, motherfuckers. My name is Sam. Hello. And today I'm going to be talking to you all about the majestic elegance of one of history's greatest tales, the Lion King. Get it, tales like tales, because lions have tails. No? Okay. Well, today we'll be looking at all the fascinating details, secrets, and behind-the-scenes wonders of one of the most successful film series of all time. No need to thank me, the pleasure is all main. Get it? Ma oh, this is gonna be rough. Anyway, which supposedly African animal featured in the original film isn't all that African? How did the jolly warthog Pumba help make Disney history? And will the new film prompt an angry yet entirely useless petition led by petulant fanboys claiming it ruined their childhood? Two out of three of these questions are going to be answered, so get yourself comfy, grab yourself some delicious grubs, and be prepared, <laughs> like the song, get it, to listen to my voice for the next few minutes, or 30, as we count through 101 facts about the Lion King. Number one. The Lion King is a Disney media franchise centered around an animated musical film series as the main course, with various additional media volivants on the side. The franchise follows the thrilling highs and heartbreaking lows of a pride of anthropomorphic lions who rule over a large area of the African savanna known as the Pride Lands, which form their kingdom. It's all very royalist when you think about it. <coughs> Number two. The first in the series was the 1994 film, simply titled The Lion King, which was produced by Walt Disney Feature Animation and released by Walt Disney Pictures. The Lion King was directed by Roger Allers and Rob Minkoff and produced by Don Hahn. From a screenplay credited to Irene Mechi, Jonathan Roberts, and Linda Wolverton, i.e. a lot of people you've never heard of having a massive impact on your childhood. Number 3. The idea for The Lion King was conceived in late 1988, on one of those newfangled flying machines called Aeroplanes. Jeffrey Katzenberg, Roy E. Disney, and Peter Schneider were chatting while on a flight to Europe to promote the 1988 American animated musical film Oliver and Company, during which the topic of a story set in Africa arose. As it would. Katzenberg immediately jumped at the idea, not literally, he was on a plane, setting off a series of events which would culminate in the creation of The Lion King several years later. Number 4. Thomas Schumacher, one of the film's exec producers, claimed that the film focused on lions rather than other species or topics because, and I'm quoting him exactly here, lions are cool. I mean, he's not wrong, lions are cool, except when they're in the desert because then they're all hot. Ha ha ha. Comedy. Number 5. Thomas Dirsch, the author of the 1980 novel The Brave Little Toaster, which was later adapted into a 1987 film with the same name, wrote an initial treatment for the film called King of the Kalahari. Following that, American screenwriter Linda Wolverton spent a year writing draft scripts, which was initially titled King of Beasts and later King of the Jungle. Even though it's not in a jungle. A wee number six and a wire. The original version of the film was actually quite different from the finished product, very quite different in fact. In the early stages of the film's development, the plot followed a conflict between the lions and a group of baboons led by Scar. Additionally, Rafiki was originally a cheetah instead of a mandrill, Timon and Pumbaa were Simba's friends from childhood, and Simba did not eventually leave the Pride Lands but was manipulated by Scar into becoming lazy and slovenly so that he could be easily overthrown after coming of age. Number 7. Not only that, but in early drafts, Scar was of no relation to Mufasa at all. Eventually, however, the writers felt that having Scar be related to Mufasa would have been more interesting, constituting a threat from within Mufasa's own family. This is the reason why Scar and Mufasa differ so much, because they originally weren't designed to be brothers. Number 8. In order to get a better idea of how the film would be realized, several of the film's lead crew members, including Alice, Shripner, Hahn, Chapman, and production designer Chris Sanders, all took a trip to the menacingly named Hell's Gate National Park in Kenya, Africa. While there, the group observed animal movement, behavior, and interaction in its natural environment, which really helped us believe that the talking animals were as authentic as possible. Apart from the whole, you know, talking thing. Number 9. In addition, the Pride Lands, which the lions inhabit in the film, are modelled on Hell's Gate National Park. It's the power of research, everybody. Always do the research. Number 10. Not only that, a range of African animals at various ages, including actual lions, were brought into the animation studio in the United States as models for anatomy and musculature. Sort of like a life drawing class, except the animals don't know that they're naked subjects. It's a bit weird when you put it like that, actually. <clears throat> Let's move on. Number 11. The Lion King was the first Disney animated film to feature an original story, rather than being based on an already existing work. 
That being said though, it's well known that the film's plot is heavily inspired by, <laughs> ripped off, William Shakespeare, or Billy Shakes as I call him, and his famous tragedy Hamlet, as well as the biblical stories of Moses and Joseph. Number 12. The film's voice actors were chosen based on how they fit their respective animal characters. That's kind of good casting, really, that's how you should cast everything. Anyway, James Earl Jones, for instance, was cast owing to his distinctive voice, described as powerful and similar to a lion's roar. Number 13. Nathan Lane and Ernie Sabella originally auditioned for the hyenas Banzai and Shenzi, and at the time were both appearing together in the 1992 revival Guys and Dolls. Upon meeting each other at the recording studio, the actors read their lines with one another, producing a performance that so impressed the filmmakers that they were instead cast as Timon and Pumbaa. Number 14. For the hyenas, the original intention was to reunite the popular comedy duo Cheech and Chong. But while Cheech Marin accepted the role of Banzai, Tommy Chong was sadly unavailable. His role was changed to a female hyena, Shenzi, who was voiced by the celebrated actor and comedian Whoopi Goldberg. Number 15. In addition to the aforementioned actors, the film featured an ensemble voice cast that includes a number of well-known and acclaimed performers, including Matthew Broderick, Jeremy Irons, Jonathan Taylor Thomas, Moira Kelly, Rowan Atkinson, and Jim Cummings. Don't laugh at that name, you're better than that. Number 16. According to animator Andreas Deja, rewrites of the script were so common that animators would sometimes deliver completed scenes, only to be told that their work needed to be redone as a result of dialogue changes. Well, that just sounds infuriating. All in a day's work as a Disney animator, I guess. Number 17. Simba and Scar were actually animated on separate coasts of the US. While Deja, Scar's lead animator, worked from Florida, Mark Henn, Simba's lead animator, was working from California, meaning that the animation team had to literally go back and forth to create some of the film's most beloved scenes. Number 18. Oh no, that's the wrong film. More than 600 artists, animators, and technicians ultimately contributed to The Lion King over the course of its lengthy production. More than 1 million drawings were produced in order to create the film, including 1,197 hand painted backgrounds and 119,058 individually coloured frames of film. Number 19. This is all the more impressive given that production was significantly affected by the 1994 Northridge earthquake, which had a magnitude of 6.7. The powerful quake shut off the studio and required many of the film's animators to finish their work from home. Number 20. Though children around the world fell in love with the film's adorable characters, a number of other no doubt adorable creatures developed for the film were ultimately left out of the final product, including Me Too, Nala's little brother who Simba was originally going to save from the stampede, and a friend of Nala's named Barty, a wisecracking bat-eared fox. Other forgotten Lion King characters include a lizard named Iggy and a relative of Timon named Tesma. Number 21. Originally, Scar's minions were going to be cape dogs, but they were eventually changed to spotted hyenas for a couple of reasons. First of all, cape dogs are an endangered species, and humans need to feel like animals are our friends before we care about saving them. And secondly, because African lions and spotted hyenas are actually natural enemies in real life. Number 22. Ooh, ooh. The film's original songs were written by the near-legendary composer Elton John along with lyricist Tim Rice. <laughs> what am I doing? While the film's score was created by the also near-legendary German film score composer Hans Zimmer, supplemented by traditional African music arranged by South African composer Libahang Marek, also known as Libo M. Number 23. Several of the characters in The Lion King have names that are based on Swahili words. For instance, Simba is the Swahili word for lion, which is a bit lazy, but whatever. Sarabi means mirage, Rafiki means friend, Pumba means simpleton or fool, and Shenzi means barbarian. Number 24. The animators were so impressed with Jeremy Irons' performance as Scar, oh yeah, sorry, Jeremy Irons plays Scar by the way, that they actually worked Irons' facial features into the character's design. Quite the compliment when you think about it, not everybody gets the honour of having their face transposed onto an evil cartoon lion. Certainly never happened to me. Number 25. In addition, while most of the other lions have their claws hidden throughout the film, Scar's claws are always on show, implying his violent and evil nature. I don't think that's based on Jeremy Irons, though. I assume he doesn't have claws. Number 26. Near the beginning of the film, the famous musical motif from Beethoven's Ode to Joy from its Ninth Symphony can be heard very briefly in the scene in which King Mufasa is rudely awoken by his precocious young son Simba. Number 27. While recording the scene in which Simba gets pinned down by Nala, young Simba's voice actor Jonathan Taylor Thomas was slapped hard on his back to make it sound like he'd just got the wind knocked out of him. Because he had. Because someone hit him in the back. Number 28. In early versions of the film, Simba's mother Sarabi was originally going to sing Simba a lullaby called The Lion in the Moon. 
The song tells the story of a protective lion spirit that watches over them, which Sarabi sings to her son after he and Nala escape the hyenas. In the final film, however, the song was replaced with a sequence in which Mufasa teaches Simba about the great kings of the past. Number 29. Interestingly, at the end of this scene, in which Mufasa explains that the stars are old kings, the constellation Leo, also known as the Lion, can be seen in the sky. Very sneaky, Disney. Very sneaky indeed. Number 30. Some of Mufasa's vocalations were in fact recycled from those created by Beast from the 1991 Disney animation Beauty and the Beast. Very lazy, Disney. Very lazy indeed. Number 31. Jim Cummings, who voiced Ed the Hyena in the film, had to fill in for Jeremy Irons for the finale of Be Prepared, as Irons actually threw his voice out after bellowing the line, You won't get a sniff without me! Irons screwed up his voice to such an extent while performing this chilling threat that the rest of his recording literally didn't sound powerful enough to put in the film. Number 32. While Scar is singing his ominous ode to regicide, two hyenas wave skeletons against a wall, creating shadow images of them dancing. This is highly reminiscent of the dancing skeletons from Night on Bald Mountain, the frankly terrifying final segment of the 1940 Disney animation Fantasia. Number 33. The unforgettable wildebeest stampede orchestrated by Scar, which culminates in the heartbreaking death of, spoiler alert here, Mufasa, took approximately three years to animate. The scene required Disney to create an entirely new computer program to allow for the animation of hundreds of computer-generated animals running together without colliding into each other. Number 34. Mufasa's death in The Lion King is widely regarded as one of the saddest and most traumatizing moments of any Disney film, and perhaps in all of cinema. According to the filmmakers though, this scene was originally even more heartbreaking and intense than it already is, but was toned down when several children began to cry uncontrollably when the initial version was screened to a test audience. Cool, so it's me, Chris, here for three facts doing a recording because Sam didn't do them and he can't do them because he's on holiday. <sighs> Number 35. In early versions of the film, Timon and Pumba were going to sing Simba a song called Warthog Rhapsody, in which the pair extolled the virtues of eating insects. However, the filmmakers eventually decided that an entire song about chowing down on grubs and bugs wasn't a great idea, and replaced it with the now beloved song entitled Hakuna Matata, which features a small interlude about eating insects instead. Number 36. One of the bugs underneath the log that Timon lifts up at the start of said Hakuna Matata bug-eating interlude has the Mickey Mouse logo as part of the pattern on its carapace. It's small, but it's there. Number 37. Ah! Hakuna Matata originally featured an extra verse, in which Timon explained the trouble he'd had in the past with fitting in with other meerkats. Here in the 21st century, you and Pumba are squad goals AF. Okay, you can start whining now, Sam's back. Number 38. Pumba the Warthog was the first character in any Disney film to exhibit flatulence. Ernie Sabella once stated that he was proud to have made the history in such a way, having created Pumba's cheek flappers by pressing his hand against his mouth and forcing out air, a practice that Google informs me is actually called zaberting. Bonus fact for you there, 102 facts today. Number 39. Timon and Pumba's famous friendship is actually somewhat based in fact. In the wild, meerkats often stay close to warthogs in order to eat fleas and ticks off their bodies, which the warthogs allow as it relieves them of these itchy, biting insects. The meerkats get to eat, and the warthogs get not to be munched on by parasites. Win-win. But which is your favorite character from our classic duo? Tenacious Timon or Plucky Pumba? Let us know in our snazzy YouTube poll. Number 40. The mane that Simba grows after becoming an adult was supposedly inspired by John Bon Jovi's celebrated rock star hair, though this look was apparently toned down after Matthew Broderick was cast as adult Simba's voice actor. Number 41. When Simba collapses on the cliff after chatting with Timon and Pumbaa about stars, the dust that flies off the cliff forms the word SEX in big capital letters. Is something an incorrect person would say? Despite being very wrong, this enduring rumor isn't entirely unjustified, as the dust does in fact form the letters SFX, which is only one line away. The abbreviation SFX was included by the special effects team that worked on that portion of the film. But despite the fact the dust definitely doesn't spell out a rude word, the 2003 Platinum edition of the film omits it altogether to avoid controversy. The meaning of life. Originally, Mufasa did not appear in the film after his death, but the film's producers felt Simba needed a reason to go back to Pride Rock. As a result, the famous scene in which Simba sees his father's face in the clouds was then added to the movie, giving Simba the encouragement he needed to return home. Number 43. 
when the gang are attempting to infiltrate Pride Rock, which is currently occupied by Scar and his legions of hyenas, Simone's line, What do you want me to do, dress and drag and do the hula? was improvised by Nathan Lane. Number 44. Apparently, the original version of the film's final fight sequence actually saw Simba lose to Scar, though Scar then died in a fire. Yeah, that's not as satisfying as Simba launching Scar off a cliff to be eaten alive by the hyenas he betrayed. Number 45. Uh... Though the setting of the film is definitely somewhere on the continent of Africa, there are some minor, let's say, inaccuracies in the selection of animal species seen in the movie. Little over a minute into the film's iconic opening sequence, a line of leafcutter ants can be seen scuttling across a branch above a herd of zebras. Despite the fact that leafcutter ants are only found in South and Central America, Mexico and parts of the Southern United States. So, all this time, the Lion King has been lying to me. More like the Lion King. Lying ki- <sighs> We're not even halfway through. Number 46. To make matters worse, meerkats are only found in parts of Namibia, Botswana, and South Africa, almost 3,000 kilometers away from Hell's Gate National Park in Kenya, upon which the main setting of the film was heavily based. I guess Timon could be an immigrant, I suppose? Oh no, sorry, he's an expat. Gotta get that right. Number 47. A few weeks before the film premiered, Elton John was given a special screening, at which point he noticed that the film's acclaimed love song, Can You Feel the Love Tonight, had been conspicuously left out. John successfully lobbied Jeffrey Katzenberg to have the song put back in, which was apparently the correct instinct, because the song won him an Oscar for Best Original Song at the 67th Academy Awards in 1995. Number 48. For its release in Africa, The Lion King became the first and so far only Disney cartoon to be dubbed into Zulu, the most widely spoken language in South Africa. Number 49. Upon its release, The Lion King also became only the third Disney film not to feature any humans whatsoever, after the classic 1942 film Bambi and the beloved 1973 Disney film Robin Hood. Number 50. The Lion King eventually went on to become the second highest grossing film of 1994 in the US, losing out on the top spot to Forrest Gump. Still, The Lion King was the highest grossing film of 1994 worldwide, so suck it, America. <laughs> Just kidding, America, you know I love you. Number 51. Since then, The Lion King has become the highest grossing hand drawn animated feature of all time, with total box office earnings of over $987 million. Ho oh, ho! That's. Uh, carry the 5 plus the 1, divide by the square root of your mum. Uh, almost a billion! Number 52. The Lion King is also the best selling home video of all time across all home video formats, including VHS, DVD, and Blu ray disc, having sold more than 55 million copies to date. Number 53. Not only that, but according to a 1995 article in Entertainment Weekly, Disney made more than $1 billion on Lion King merchandise in 1994 alone. That's enough to buy a frankly terrifying amount of chicken nuggets. Number 54. All of the Lion King's success is made all the sweeter by the fact that the team working on the movie was apparently Disney's Team B, who worked on the film while Team A created the 1995 feature Pocahontas, with the powers that be assuming that that would perform far better commercially. Plot twist, the Lion King went on to become a gargantuan critical and commercial success, while Pocahontas was met with mixed reviews and made significantly less money. Ha, gutted Huntus. Let me see how I do it. Number 55. In July of 2017, the character Scar was pictured on one of 10 USA non-denominated commemorative postage stamps celebrating Disney villains, alongside various other notorious Disney antagonists such as Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty, Cruella de Vil from 101 Dalmatians, that's too many Dalmatians, isn't it really, and Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. Number 56. As the villainous characters in the film, some animal experts have argued that the hyenas are actually presented rather unfairly in the movie. With their intricate social structure, spotted hyenas are actually widely considered to be equitable to lions in terms of intelligence. And while the film portrayed hyenas as nearly full-on scavengers, in reality lions scavenge the kills of hyenas as much as hyenas scavenge lions kills, if not more so. Hashtag justice for hyenas. Number 57. As a result of this reprehensible and unjust characterization of hyenas in The Lion King, Disney was at one point actually sued by a hyena researcher for defamation of character. Yeah, really. For the avoidance of doubt here, just so you know, you can't sue someone because they made fun of your favorite animal. Number 58. Not only that, but another hyena researcher named Lawrence Frank, who was incidentally one of the scientists who helped organize a trip for the film's animators to observe captive hyenas in California, half-jokingly suggested that the Lion King be boycotted as a way to promote better awareness and understanding of hyenas. 
God, and they call us the snowflake generation. Number 59. Then in 1998, along came the inevitable sequel in the form of The Lion King 2, colon, Simba's Pride. The Lion King 2, Electric Boo Zazu would have been a better title, but that's just my opinion. The film tells the story of yet another king-killing plot, but this time against Simba himself. Oh no. Number 60. We've already mentioned the first Lion King is similar to Billy Shakespeare's play Hamlet, just with less roughs and without a title that for some reason makes me hungry. Anyway, Simba and co weren't done with ripping off the shakes to just yet. Simba's pride has similarities with Romeo and Juliet, in that there's a big old family fight and two lovers in the middle of it. Ugh, lovers. Horrible word. Number 61. The character of Kovu, the adopted son of Zira, who was raised to avenge Scar's death by killing Simba, was originally called Nunca, but then he wasn't. You're welcome. Number 62. Most of these names actually mean something in Swahili. Kovu is Swahili for Scar, which is nice and relevant given that he was adopted by Scar, and also has a massively conspicuous scar on his face. Scar. Number 63. Similarly, the name of the character Nuka, Kovu's Mengi brother, is the Swahili word for bad smell. Which is kind of cruel, really, but hey, he's a baddie. Maybe that's why he's a baddie. Nintendo 64. That being said, it's worth saying that the name Vitani, Kovu and Nuka's sister, has no meaning in Swahili. Apparently, though, she was originally called Chitani, which Disney may have changed because it's a Swahili word for she-demon. <laughs> Chitani. Number 65. Scandalously, duh, duh, so scandalous, the ferocious sound of lions roaring that can be heard in Simba's pride are in fact not lions at all. Same for the first Lion King too. They're actually one of two things. They're either tiger roars, which is a big insult to lions, isn't it really? Or a man named Frank screaming into a metal bin. That's true, by the way. There's actual footage of that happening. This is all because, in reality, lion's roars aren't actually that powerful. Soz lions. Number 66. Captain Nerd Joss Whedon, the director of the first two Avengers movies and the creator of Buffy and Firefly, actually wrote the lyrics for the song My Lullaby. It went on to receive an Annie nomination, so well done, you big nerd. Number 67. At one point in the movie, Timon and Pumbaa are doing their thing and having a big old tiff, which is British for fight. During the spat, Pumbaa rather harshly calls Timon a fat, fat, fatty. This is thought to be a reference to the producers, during which Simba actor Matthew Broderick says the same thing to Nathan Lane, who plays Timon. Number 68. Nuka goes and dies in the movie, like one would hope a bad smell does. But, originally when Nuka died, his last words weren't, I'm sorry mother, I tried. But instead, the slightly more passive-aggressive, I'm sorry mother, I tried. I guess I finally got your attention, didn't I? Number 69. Can you feel Pumba tonight? Apparently, there was an extended version of Zira's death too. Oh, by the way, Zira dies as well. Sorry. It's the same as before, actually, but Kiara offers to help, which Zira refuses and says never. Apparently, the filmmakers concluded that this was too morbid for a Disney film, and they were right, and they changed the scene. Number 70. The hyenas Shenzi, Banzai, and Ed were originally going to appear in the sequel, but they were later removed and the filmmakers eventually realised that the idea of them being Zira's henchmen wouldn't make sense given that they killed Scar, of whom Zira was a devoted follower. And they didn't just kill him either, they ate him alive! Which would be a bit awkward to explain to Zero, really, wouldn't it? Number 71. However, Simba's mother Sarabi did get a cameo. Unfortunately, the cameo was entirely mute, because Madge Sinclair, the actress who voiced Sarabi in the first film, sadly died before the sequel started production. Number 72. In 2004, the Lion King series became a trilogy, with the arrival of the Lion King 3 Hakuna Matata, which focuses on the various hijinks and escapades of Timon and Pumbaa, both before and during the events of the original Lion King film. Number 73. If you're watching this from the US or Canada, hello, but also, you probably don't have any idea what I'm talking about. That's because, in North America, the film is for some reason known as the Lion King 1 and a half. Out of all the things you've done, America, that might be the worst. Number 74. Similarly to its predecessors, the film takes inspiration from Shakespeare, sort of. Retelling the story of the first film from the perspective of two other characters is highly reminiscent of the play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, an absurdist play by Tom Stoppard in which the events of Hamlet are seen from the perspective of two minor characters. Crikey, Lion King, just be original! Number 75. In Lion and a Half Kings, or whatever the hell it was called, Timon sings a song named That's All I Need. This is actually yet again sort of ripped off from the first one, as it's a reworked version of the previously mentioned song Warthog Rhapsody, which was replaced by Hakuna Matata in the original film. Number 76. 
Here's something else that this film stole. When Timon and Simba are having their snail competition, the music in the background comes from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Why? I have no clue, and I don't think I ever will. Number 77. Not impressed with that? Well, how about this absolutely insane mistake? Zazu, Bird up. a well-loved character in the franchise, has his name misspelled in the credits, with an S where the second Z should be. Oh, that's a disgrace. I think I'm going to be sick. Number 78. But let's not dwell on the mistakes of the past. Let's instead move forward and talk about the grand spanking new 2019 Lion King film. Yes, the Lion King has a new lick of CGI paint and looks hot to trot. The film will tell the story of- oh no, it's a reboot, isn't it? Yeah, you know the story already. Moving on. Number 79. Nearly everything in this new rebooted version of The Lion King is different, with the sole solitary exception of James Earl Jones, who again plays Mufasa, making him the only actor to reprise his role from the original film. Number 80. Well, sort of. I kind of lied there, because not everything is different about the film, owing to the fact that Hans Zimmer, Elton John, and Tim Rice have also refilled their own shoes as their respective composer and songwriters for the new film. Number 81. Chiwetel Ejiofor won the role of Scar apparently after the director of the movie, Iron Man's John Favreau, saw his performance as Mordo in 2016's Doctor Strange. Too many lions. Number 82. This time, Billy on the Street Eichner and Seth in the Clouds Rogan play Timon and Pumbaa. They recorded their lines together with Donald Glover, who plays Simba in the film, which is unusual for voiceover work, as performers usually have to stand all alone in a recording booth, a fact with which I am too well acquainted. Number 83. John Favreau revealed in an interview that he brought back James Earl Jones as the voice of Mufasa because he saw it as a continuation of the original film's legacy. He also stated that simply hearing him say the lines was moving and surreal, and that the change in Jones's voice since the recording of the first film served the role well because he sounded like a king who's ruled for a long time. Number 84. The song Be Prepared was going to be left out of the movie due to its fairly noticeable Nazi themes, and the fact that Chiwetel Ejiofor, the new Scar, may not be up for singing it. However, Disney and Co relented and eventually put it back in the movie, so be prepared for that. <laughs> God. Number 85. Edgy of Four has described his version of Scar as more psychologically possessed and brutalized than the original, stating that at the end of it, you're playing someone who has the capacity to turn everything on its head in a split second with outrageous acts of violence. God, wow, he sounds ferocious, like a, like a lion or something. Maybe even an evil lion. Number 86. Some absolute idiots keep making the mistake of referring to the film as a live-action remake, even though it's not live-action even in the slightest. The film contains no real humans or real anything in the film at all. All CGI. So, number 87. The film has been in production since mid-2017 using virtual reality tools, apparently, as well as augmented reality and motion capture. Basically, it seems more digital than if Tron and the Cloud had a baby, which would be an abomination before God. Basically the exact opposite of my darling Kentucky Rose Jennifer Lawrence, who is God's angel. Number 88. Young Nala will be played by actress Shahadi Wright Joseph, whereas the older version will be played by Queen of Everything, who seems to like lemonade quite a lot, the one and only Beyonce. Joseph has stated that when she found out that her future self in Lion Cub form would be played by Bay herself, she literally screamed, which must have been unnerving to everyone else around, and felt the need to step up her game. Number 89. Favreau has stated that Beyonce herself was an inspiration for Nala and her fierce character moments. He said, I wanted the way she was choreographed to have a resonance with the power with which Beyonce choreographs her stage show. I mean, yeah, when you've got Beyonce on board, you want to get your money's worth. Number 90. Weirdly, Beyonce's film debut was the 2002 American spy action comedy film Austin Powers in Goldmember. That's strange enough on its own, but in a staggering twist of fate, she shares a scene in the film with Nathan Lane, the voice of the original Timon thus making it relevant to this list. Lovely. Number 91. Actor John Caney played Rafiki, but has said that his version is very different to his zany animated counterpart. The new Rafiki is a supposedly more down-to-earth and no-nonsense character this time around, which the original Rafiki would probably find quite disappointing, really. Number 92. You'll notice that Timon is crawling along on all fours a lot of the time in this movie, whereas in the 2D animated films he always stood, walked, or ran like he was a tiny little person. This is because real meerkats only stand on two legs, and always move on all fours. Number 93. I hope you have your tissues ready for this movie, and no, not for that reason, you absolute weirdos. Billy Eichner has revealed that when he heard a rough cut of Beyonce singing for the movie, he was genuinely moved to tears. God, I wish my singing could make someone cry. Like, in a good way, I mean. Number 94. 
It seems like this is going to make absolutely all the money ever. According to Box Office Pro, the film's long-range tracking is anywhere between $180 million and $230 million just for its opening weekend. Chicken nuggets? That's enough for nuggets of something else that's more valuable than chicken. Number 95. Here's a nice connection for you. John Favreau, Donald Glover, Chewie Tielagy 4, Alfre Woodard, John Caney, and Florence Kasumba all have roles in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Who are they? Well, let me tell ya. Favreau directed two Iron Man films and played Happy Hogan. Glover plays Aaron Davis in Spider-Man Homecoming. Asia 4 plays Mordo in Doctor Strange. Woodard plays Mariah Stokes in Luke Cage, as well as Miriam Sharp in a cameo role in Civil War, while Caney and Kasumba portray T'Chaka and Io in Black Panther, respectively. Number 96. In summary, the Lion King brand is pretty heckin' successful. Not only do we have the films, but there are also several Lion King shorts, two spin-off TV series, a number of video games, mountains of merch, and a musical too. Number 97. Speaking of the musical, the stage adaptation of The Lion King opened on Broadway all the way back in 1997. It's since bagged itself a total of six Tony Awards for all its stagey goodness, and over 100 million people have seen it all over the world. It's good, basically. Number 98. Incidentally, one of the Tonys that The Lion King won was for Best Direction of a Musical, making director Judy Taymor the first woman to earn such an honour. The Lion King doesn't just smash box offices, it also smashes glass ceilings, guys, yeah? Number 99. The success of the musical meant that the whole Lion King franchise is actually egotted, meaning it has an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. That's pretty special. Well done, Simba. I don't know who else to congratulate. He's the one thing connecting it all. Number 100! <laughs> Across 25 productions staged over two decades to a combined audience of over 90 million people, The Lion King musical has taken in over $8.1 billion. Yes, billion with a buh. I can't even think what I could buy with that. An island of chicken nuggets, maybe? Number 101! <laughs> The Lion King, or rather the Pride Lands, also feature as a world you can visit in the overly confusing plot-drenched RPG series Kingdom Hearts, specifically in Kingdom Hearts 2. The characters turn into creatures that could be found here too. It's a shame really this wasn't canon. Then maybe this could have been The Lion King 3, rather than just doing the first film again. Anyway, that was 101 facts about The Lion King. Which Lion King movie is your favourite? Which Lion King song is your favourite? Which lion is your favourite? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, give this video a like and subscribe to 101 Facts if you haven't done so already, and click on the little bell so you can see our videos when they come up. In the meantime, though, look at these two videos here. They're fit for royalty. Like a, I don't know, some sort of Lion King, maybe, or Queen, because you might be a lady. Uh, either way, enjoy those two videos, and I'll see you there. Bye!